On this entry of the STEM journals, armies of ants, swarms of bees, and tree-eating termites when I connect with social insects. Author, musician, meteorite hunter, adventurer. I've led an eventful life. Now I'm exploring exciting STEM careers and recording what I find in the STEM journals. STEM journals, initial entry. I've been up to my eyeballs in road trips, meteorite hunts, and other STEM research. Whenever I get a few spare moments of downtime, priority one is reconnecting with my high-tech friends around the world by updating my accounts spread over many social networks. It's occurred to me many times that humans aren't the only beings to share and benefit from interactive experiences. Group communication is common in the animal kingdom, especially so with eusocial insects, which, like humans, cooperate at amazing levels for food production, care for their young, and defense of their homes. My young STEM investigators will be very pleased to know that there are many wonderful research projects and career opportunities working with bees, wasps, ants, even termites. And now that I've finished my tea and finished my status updates, I'm outside the Pratt Lab here at Arizona State University to find out if humanity can learn a thing or two from the way ants work together. Stephen, thanks so much for inviting me to the lab. I'm researching social insects. It's a topic that's of great interest to me. Well, I think you've come to the right place then. I've got several thousand research subjects I think you'd like to meet. Excellent. Oh, nice. I like the Sex Pistols reference. That's great. Yeah, you can meet some of our punk rock ants as well. <laughs> Even better. I have to admit, I don't know a whole lot about ants, although I thought they lived underground. These guys seem to have their own high-rise combo. It's very impressive. What's going on here? Normally, they would live underground. We've kind of taken them out of their normal nest and put them into this sort of plastic version. That's where the brood is, the young ants, that's where most of the workers are, and that's where the queen is. So the queen is the mother of all of these ants. All of these worker ants are her daughters. The key thing to know about ants is there's no such thing as a solitary ant. They're some of the most social animals on Earth. And these ants are harvester ants, so what they're doing is seeking out food and they spread out here into the foraging arena we made for them, and they'll collect those seeds and bring them back to this long tube and feed them to their nest mates, feed them to the young, and feed them to their queen. There's also another species we have here from Arizona you might have heard of. They're called the honeypot ants. <sighs> They're huge. And those are called repletes because they basically store food for the rest of the colony. They apparently taste pretty good. I've never eaten one myself, but you know, some Native Americans uh, at least used to dig them up and they, they, they eat them like grapes and they're a little crunchy maybe. <laughs> but what their, their purpose for the ants, right, is that they tide them over long periods when there may not be uh, much food or water. A solitary insect, that would never make sense to do that, right? Because she's basically incapacitated. Right. She can hardly move. And I think I've got a tough job. Oh, indeed. <laughs> Now, different types of ants over here? Yeah, here we have, these are leafcutter ants. In nature, they would go and find leaves, fresh leaves, chop them into little pieces, and instead of feeding them to their fellow ants, they instead use it to feed a fungus garden. It's really? Like, it's like they're growing mushrooms. And so the ants don't eat the leaves, the ants eat the mushrooms. So they're farmers? They're basically farmers. But instead of growing, you know, wheat or barley or raising chickens or something like that, they grow mushrooms and they feed it with leaves. That's really sophisticated. Yes, they are very sophisticated societies. One of the main reasons I'm interested in ants is because they are able to carry out extremely sophisticated group behaviors. And they do it without anyone being in charge. It's a totally decentralized system. It's a collective. It's a collective, exactly. That reminds me of something from science fiction. Oh, I'm loving that. <laughs> you tell me. Maybe the Borg? Yes. Yes, well, they're a lot like the Borg. We like to think they're nicer than the Borg, a little less menacing. <laughs> That's not hard. But like the Borg, they're really fascinating, right? It's incredible that you can have a, basically a collective intelligence. So this is kind of a benevolent anarchic society, which makes the Sex Pistols reference out there on the board even more apropos than there I originally yeah. thought. Indeed. Yes, they are sort of successful anarchists. And so you might think that the queen is the brain. She's in charge. No one is in charge. And yet, the colony as a whole is still able to make really good collective decisions, like about what to eat or where to live. Well, it sounds to me like you're talking about rational thought. Is that possible? I think that's exactly what we're talking about, really. Mainly what we study here is decision making. So what we do with our ants is we give them decision challenges, sometimes pretty hard ones, and we try to see how good a colony is at solving those challenges. How good are they at, at making the right decision and making a rational choice? 
And the main thing we work on with them these days is how do they choose where to live. And so they want to move pretty fast, but they also want to make sure they move into a good home. And so ideally, they'd like to compare lots of possible nests out there, figure out which one's the best one, and then move into that one. If I ask why, I, why do I study these insects, I think that the existence of a collective intelligence is just a really basically you know, fascinating thing. It's just amazing to me that over millions of years, this evolved. Stephen, I find your work fascinating, but what can studying the collective intelligence of ants do for humanity? Hmm, that's a good question. The answer I like to give first is that this is just a sort of wonder of nature. When you see something this spectacular, it's like bat sonar or something like that. You really just have to figure it out. And so I, you know, I study how these little tiny colonies of rock ants make decisions. There's some other ants we study as well who are very, very good at carrying things. Everyone has seen this, right? You see a group of ants carrying some large piece of food to their nest. Mm -hmm. uh, some ants are better at it than others, and it happens that there's an ant here in the, in the deserts of Arizona who's extremely good at it. And so we are now studying them and trying to find out how they do it. And again, how do you get a team together of the right size? How do they know what direction to go? How do they know when to pull and when to push? And that interests us, but that also really interests people working in robotics. There's a whole field out there of people doing swarm robotics, where they try to build uh, collectives of often very simple robots and get them to work together. And so one thing they need to do is move things. Uh, and they're lousy at it. You know, the current technological state of the art for collective transport by robots is really bad. And so my engineering colleagues are hoping they can learn something from how ants do it. Just as you yourself once moved from ants to bees, I feel that should be my next step as well. Ah, well, I know just the place you should go. You should visit Gru Amdong's lab out at the ASU Honeybee Annex. Yeah, I was afraid you might say something like that. Ants uncomfortable around bees, uh, not so sure. Well, be careful, they do sting. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm afraid of. Coming up on the STEM journals, are honeybees able to reverse their aging process? I suit up and check out the bugs. Becca, you'll be pleased to know that I've been doing some serious research on social insects for the benefit of you and your other young STEM investigators, and I've uncovered some very interesting information about ants and swarm intelligence. Mm, interesting stuff, but I bet no picnic. <laughs> very funny. Actually, you're here to do a bit about the bees, and I like bees, I just don't like to be around bees. So that's why I've called you down here, because I'd like now, you... Now, wait just a minute, Jeff. I'm terribly frightened of bees. I can hear them buzzing just from here. I'm not about that, if you right. know what I mean. So it's not just me then. I think in addition to our shared love of STEM subjects, we may share apophobia. Fear of bees, And I'm wasps. Ah. Yeah, which is a shame because they're doing some really interesting research here at ASU's Bee Annex about bees and brain aging. Hmm. Well, how about both you and I face our fears and go in together? That's an excellent idea. After you. Oh, you're such a gentleman. All right, Jeff, Becca. The best way to get to know bees is to see them up firsthand right when they begin their adult life. These bees, as adults, are no older than 24 hours. They've just emerged from these cells. The queen will look around at these cells, make sure they're all clean and tidy, and then she'll lay an egg on the back of the cell. I can just imagine the queen coming in and doing an inspection and going, no, no, this one's not clean enough. <laughs> Who's responsible for this? She'll poke her head in, she'll be like, no, nope, not doing it. And she'll move on a little bit. As you can see, these are the ones that they just broke out of. Above it, they're still waiting to emerge. You can see one emerge right here. You guys see oh, it? Oh, wow. So they're not the best flyer right when they start off. They're also bad at stinging too. Which is also one of the reasons why I'm holding it barehanded. Oh, that's good news. So we don't have to be, oh, Becca doesn't have to be overly concerned about being stung. 
I'm okay. Are you okay? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's fine. Love bees. Super. Well, Jeff, uh, would you like to give it a go? Uh, no. I mean, okay. So put your thumbs right here. Get a good grip. There you go. A lot more on that side, right? Ooh. Uh, yeah, that's a lot of bees. I think I'll give them back to you. All right. Thanks. Thank you. There's one in your hand. Ah! I mean, oh, nice. So, um, we'll go ahead and get you guys some veils and any kind of gear that you guys would want. Uh, I think probably the safest, uh, thickest, most bee-proof bee suit that you have is what I'd, I'd like Becca to wear just, you know, for safeties. Just for Becca? Well, I'll wear one as well. You know, I don't want people staring at her and going, person in the bee suit. I'll make sure I get a bee suit that's good for, you know, Becca. Okay, and yeah. And make sure that Becca is well protected. Yeah. I, and I, has plenty of gear for thanks. Becca. Thanks. I, I would really appreciate that, yeah. Are you ready to boldly go where no one has gone before? Yes, a world beyond our imagination. <laughs> it certainly is. Oh, boy. <laughs> These aren't the little not flying, not stinging guys. So, now I'm going to return the uh, newly merged bees back. All right, Becca, would you like to do the honors? I'd be happy to. All right. We'll give them a little tap on the bottom. There you go. And now, these newly merged bees are going to make a decision. As they age, are they going to remain as nurses, or are they going to become forger bees? So since a bee only lives for 31 days, what signs determine that they're aging? You can look at the size and mass of the brains. We can also look at the behavior cues. As foragers age, and they're at day 31, they're not really flying as well, and they're also not making very good decisions. This used to be a hive full of nurses and foragers and the queen. As the foragers are going out and they're foraging, we moved the hive away and sealed it. And then we put in a new box that has nothing much in it except for brood and the queen. And through this hive trickery, what we can do is turn these foragers back into nurse bees. And um, the reason why we're doing this is because we can show that not only does their behavior change, but their health does as well. They tend to live longer, and also the proteins that are expressed and lead to degradation of the bodies go down in expression levels when they become nurses again. So what you're saying is not, not only are they changing their role in the hive, they're in a sense reversing their own aging process. That's right, and we're trying to understand how that happens and why that happens as well. well that can have really profound implications across all studies related to biology and, and possibly even, even human longevity. We're trying to understand why the aging process occurs in the first place, and what is the role of the aging process of foragers, and also, yet like what you said, how we can relate that across species. Um, how does that apply to human aging? Wait, do, do, you, do you guys hear that? What? Hear what? Sound sounds almost like, like a drumming, like African music. I don't hear anything. Well, they don't really, wait a second. Jeff, yeah. you don't think this is an Africanized hive, what? do you? Hey, uh, listen, I just remembered I've got to do something back in Tucson. What? So it's been a great day. <laughs> I'm going to buzz off. See you later. OK, bye, Jeff. Can these tiny creatures really eat us out of house and home? Up next on the STEM Journals. STEM Journals is sponsored by Copper Point, proud to sponsor STEM education because students who excel in science, technology, engineering, and math will solve the challenges of tomorrow. Becca, if you ever actually get to see this message, I'm really sorry about leaving you in the lurch back there, but all those hives were giving me the heebie-jeebies, and that means wasps are out of the question. Instead, I'm going to investigate the social insect that strikes terror into the hearts of homeowners worldwide, the termite. Paul Baker is an entomologist and termite expert from the University of Arizona, who's invited me to collect termites for his lab. Hi, Jeff. Oh, hi. 
Welcome to my world. Thanks. I am super excited to go digging for subterranean termites. I brought all my tools. I don't think you're going to need them. No? Uh, no. Look, let me show you how small these guys really are. What? Yeah. Oh, they're teeny. Really small. Look. I'll leave this stuff behind then, I guess. Yeah, that's fine. Let's, let's go check it out. OK. I know that, that bees pollinate flowers, ants aerate the soil. I also know that termites devour buildings, unfortunately, from personal experience. Do termites also play a beneficial role in the ecosystem? Absolutely. They consume dead cellulose and aerate the soil. So there's a lot of positive things for termites. So if they are so happy out here in the desert and there is all this delicious dead wood for them to chew on, why have they migrated to urban environments? Because the urban environment has provided some moisture around our houses. They like moisture and they're drawn to that. And as a result, they end up in our house. OK, Jeff, what we're going to do is look at some collection plots over here. Um, we draw the termites to us. So you'll collect the guys here and take them back to the lab. For what purpose? Well, the idea behind it is we run experiments in the lab because we can control a lot of the environmental issues. And the object of, of the experiments is to help with information about controlling termites. OK, let's have a look. OK. Here, let me put this over here. Let me take these. Can you see them? Oh, Look. yeah. Yeah. OK, so what we do is tap these guys out. Oh, there they are. Here are our boys and girls. Yeah, look at them all. It's loaded. Yeah. They like to run around. They don't like the light. That's why they're trying to find somewheres to get away from. You see them kind of button their head? They're communicating, kind of like telling each other what's going on. Because they're a caste system, they have certain ones that are specific to do a job, like the soldiers are for defense. So you can tell the difference between the soldiers yep. because he's got, a, he's got a different colored head and the pincers. Yeah, and, and as a result of that, you can distinguish them very easily. So, so soldier, worker. worker. And workers are the ones that do all the damage. They're the ones that feed on your house. So that's the object behind it, to collect them, bring them back to the lab, treat the soil, and subject the termites to that specific soil. The purpose, then, is really for you to work with pest control specialists in the lab to develop a more effective pesticide. That's true. We're working in pesticides in the lab, but also in the field. In fact, this is why we have these down here. So we've got some plots here right here. So why don't we open these up and see what we can find in them. And uh, if you open yours up, actually, I'll help you. You, you need a little help here. So then we can uh, tap these and try to find out how many termites we can see what is that? You said there were going to be pesticides. Oh, no, don't worry about that. You're OK. Believe me, they're fine. Don't worry about it. We're controlling termites, not eradicating them, controlling them, OK? It's important for people to understand that we're not interested in killing everything. We're only interested in protecting the structure, in fact, the homeowner's structure. That's kind of where we're headed. You know what? Now it all makes sense to me, because you've been working with insects for over 40 years, and I was wondering why you wanted to eradicate them. It's control, not eradication. Absolutely. And that's the beauty of a nice career in entomology, because you can always find something new and exciting to deal with. And insects are so diverse, and they give you so many opportunities to understand their ecology, understand their biology, and then eventually, in my case, most of it's aimed at helping the general public do a better job of understanding what they're dealing with and whether they need to control that, whether it's an, just an occasional invader in your house or actually it's a serious situation and they need to control it. All right? Well, Paul, thanks so much for letting me come out and collect bugs for you and your students. And that reminds me, I better check on the status of my own YSI. Still ahead on the STEM journals, our young STEM investigator braves swarming bees in the name of science.
<laughs> Sorry for playing that mean trick on you, Jeff, but you have to admit that was pretty funny. But anyways, yeah, I'm starting to get more used to being around bees, but I'm going to have to keep talking with John to learn more about them. So John, honeybees play a really important role in the world. Is it true that they're disappearing more and more every day? Yeah, we're having a lot of issues, especially in places in America. Um, some of the uh, things that occur is something called colony collapse disorder. And when this happens, uh, many of the bees within the hive evacuate for some reason, and they leave the queen all by herself with a couple of young bees and all the brood. Um, fortunately, the queen and the bees starve to death. This happens a lot during the winter time when bees are under a lot of stress with freezing. Other issues include insecticides and pesticides that we use in crops. Some of these could be sublethal effects for bees. They could look okay one day and then the next they can collapse. What got you interested in working with bees in the first place? This might sound a little bit weird, but I was always into games where you can control mass populations of people. A lot of simulations <laughs> and stuff. And you know, there was this game that came out, The Sim Ant, I always used to love to control the ants and stuff like that. But I'm still really interested in the interactions between members of the colony. And there's a lot of eusociality that occurs in hives. I'm really interested in how they don't all reproduce, but they still work together to allow the queen to reproduce. One of the big reasons is because they're related to the queen. They're all sisters to each other, and of course, they're related to th their mother. So they work together, but there's also this distribution of tasks. So, so some of them will be the nurse bees, and some will be the forager bees. But yet there is some differences in individuals. Um, even though they're all sisters to each other, some sisters might be nurses, some sisters might be foragers. So when I got the opportunity to work on bees and study their foraging behavior, I jumped on it. Well, John, I think I'm starting to get warmed up to bees a little bit more. And um, I find social insects very interesting, so I'm gonna have to look into that a little bit more. Great, hope it works out. Thank you. You're gonna really want to study social insects because they can help us understand how small parts, like individual insects, can, can lead to big systems and understand networks. So you're definitely gonna to wanna to take classes in biology, chemistry, maybe some physics, and definitely look at the crossover into psychology and sociology to see how these small parts can help us understand big systems. Next week on the STEM Journals, understanding the air we breathe with atmospheric sciences.